heard this. All right, we're look, getting into 5-1 finally here. Um, and we were, we've been working a lot with using the unit circle with our inverse trig functions. Um, the other day we just introduced or I guess reminded ourselves of the fundamental trig identities. And again, these are ones that you should know already. We did learn these. Um, so you should know them. Now, today what we're going to look at are the first two of our four applications. This chapter really... If you want an outline of the whole chapter, this is it right here, okay? Um, we're looking at applications of the identities. Today we're going to look at evaluating trig functions just briefly, and we're going to spend more time on, on number two, simplifying trig expressions. Um, and then later on we're going to actually use identities and things to develop other identities. Um, for example, what do you do when you have sine of the sum of two angles, or the difference of two angles, or something like that? Um, you know, we can develop other identities using our fundamental trig identities, okay? Also, solving trig equations, probably the most significant of the applications, actually being able to solve for angles and things. Um, is where we're headed towards the uh, the last quarter of the chapter or so. All right, so wanted to start first of all today, looking at evaluating trig functions using some identities. Okay, um, and first of all, what I want what I want to point out here, guys, is the fact that if you know the value of any one trig function and you know what quadrant you're in, then you can find the other five. Okay, using the different identities. As you do these more and more, you'll start to kind of just do them by second nature. But especially here as we're looking at them to begin with, I want you to focus on what identities you're using each step along the way. All right, so if we look at our example here, we know that the secant of angle U is negative 3 halves. And we know that the tangent of u is greater than 0. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know it's greater than 0. So if we're trying to find the other five trig functions, what would be the first thing that we might do? Find cosine. Find cosine. Why, Edward? Uh, because it's secant. OK. We know secant, and we know that cosine of u is always going to be 1 over secant, right? So what would cosine equal? Negative 2 thirds, okay? Negative 2 thirds. All right, now here we're using one of our reciprocal identities. Okay, uh, again, this is something that you may just do kind of without thinking, but especially here at this point, I want you to think about what you're actually doing um, with each of these. Okay, uh, where could we go from here? Well, maybe since uh, tangent is greater than zero, you know that sine is negative. Okay, tangent we know is positive. Where where all is tangent positive? <coughs> the third, the third. In the first and the third quadrants, right? And we have that. Okay. Now, if tangent is positive there, we also know that cosine is negative. Where is cosine negative? A two and. Two and three. Cosine's positive and one and four. Cosine's negative and two and three. So what quadrant do we have to be in? We have to be in quadrant three. All right. So 
this is what I'm saying. If we know one value of one of our trig functions, and we know the quadrant, which we had enough information to figure out, we can figure out the rest of these as well. Okay? Now, one strategy you might use would be to construct a right triangle where the adjacent side's two and the hypotenuse is three, and you could figure out the other side. But we actually don't have to do that. Can someone tell me a way that sine and cosine are related? Thinking back to our identities. Okay, we have the co-function identity where we have sine of 90 minus theta equals cosine of theta. All right, will that help us here? No, but that's good to point out. How else are sine and cosine related? Okay, what do we call those? Do you guys remember? Yeah, the Pythagorean identities. Okay, sine squared, we're dealing with u. Sine squared u plus cosine squared u equals 1. Right. So since we know what cosine is, we can plug that in. All right. Now, what do we know about sine? Before we go any further, since we're in the third quadrant, we know sine is negative. 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 Okay. So if we plug in cosine is negative two thirds, what's cosine squared? It's going to be a positive four ninths. Okay? Positive four ninths. So we know that the sine squared is five ninths. So what does sine equal? Root five over three. Good. Root five over three. Okay. And algebraically, our solution could be positive or negative root 5 over 3, okay? But because of the fact that we know we're in the third quadrant, we know our solution in this case is negative root 5 over 3, okay? Yes? So this is how is it for 4 over 9? Because uh, we square the cosine, so 2 squared over 3 squared. Um, is secant is negative three halves? Wouldn't cosine be just two thirds? Like, why is it negative? Because cosine and secant are just reciprocals. They're not. It's uh, not opposite reciprocal. Oh, okay. That was perpendicular slopes for lines. Mm -hmm. So these are just reciprocals. Okay. So now that we know sine, what can we find? Cosecant. Cosecant. What's that going to be? Okay. And there we're using our reciprocal function again, or a reciprocal function again. We know that cosecant is 1 over sine. Okay? So we have a negative 3 over root 5, and we rationalize that denominator and we get negative 3 root 5 over 5. Okay. All right, so we've got 4 out of 6. Done. So how might we finish the rest here? Okay, we've got quotient identities. All right, again, think through how, how uh, are what we're looking for and what we already know related to each other. And there's actually two ways you could do this one. Um, 
probably the simplest is sine over cosine. Okay, tangent of u is sine u over cosine u. All right, so negative root 5 over 3 divided by negative 2 thirds. Okay, yeah, the negatives cancel out, the thirds cancel out, and you have root 5 over 2 for our tangent. Does anyone see another way? Another way that we could have found tangent? Yeah? Okay, we could have found cotangent by doing uh, cosine over sine and then done the reciprocal. True? Yes? Um, one of the squared identities has two of them. Yeah, do you guys remember what that one is? I think it's plus one. Plus one. Plus one. Plus one. Secant okay, yeah. Tangent squared plus one equals secant squared. All right. Now, you'll get the same result either way, but here's one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Secant was three halves, right? So this is nine fourths. If we subtract one, that's four fourths. So we get five fourths is tangent squared, and then you square root, root 5 over 2, and that could be plus or minus root 5 over 2, but since we're in the third quadrant, we know it has to be positive, okay? So, this is kind of why these things are, I think, kind of fun, because each one's like a puzzle, and but there's more than one way you can put things together. All right, if you know your identities well, you could do any one of these problems a whole bunch of different ways. Okay, you just have to find one of them, though. Uh, by squaring secant. 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Okay, so here are two different ways of getting the same result. I just wanted to point that out because a lot of times what will happen is... You know, you might be working together with someone, practicing, and you both are doing different things. And one's, one person is saying they're right, and the other person is saying they're right. And the fact of the matter is, as long as you're doing things according to the rules, you could have two problems that look completely different, but still end up in the right, you know, with the correct answer. All right, and that's because you're just using different identities um, than the person you're working with might use. So, all right, uh, the final one, cotangent. What's that going to be? Two. Good. We take the reciprocal of tangent and rationalize the denominator two root five over five. Good. All right, any questions? Yeah, we figure out we're in the third quadrant right off the bat because secant is related to cosine. So it's negative wherever cosine is negative, which means the second or third quadrant. Tangent, it said, was positive, and that only happens in the first and third quadrant. So you kind of have to look at where those two things overlap. Do you need to find what quadrant? Like, you is do. That you? you do because if I didn't know tangent had to be positive. Oh, tangent could either be positive or negative. Yeah, and then I could have either been in the second quadrant or the third quadrant, and I wouldn't know exactly which signs to use for sine and tangent. All right, now we're going to come back and practice a little bit with this later on. Um, I do want to look at some, some simplifying, and we're going to look at a couple of different rules, and then at the end of the period, or probably the last half of the period, I'm going to have you guys working in some groups together to try to work through some of these and just practice simplifying and whatnot. Um, so. Thank you. So, uh, so that's, where, that's where we're headed the rest of today. Um, now, let's take a look at an example simplifying. 
I'll be honest with you, I don't like it when problems are just stated like this, where it says simplify, because sometimes you look at the answer and you're like, well, that's not a whole lot more simple than what they started out with. At least it doesn't look like it to me. Um, what I actually prefer are problems, maybe like this one, where it says rewrite it so it's not in a fractional form. You know, once all your fractions are gone, you're done. Okay? Uh, for this one, verify the identity. It's similar to the first one, but they tell you exactly where you, they want you to end up. All of this ought to simplify down until it's just a cosecant theta. All right? So problems like this are a little bit nebulous, but it gives us kind of a taste of of what people who developed a lot of the rules that we use had to go through. They didn't know exactly what it was going to end up looking like. They just got this formula and then said, hey, is, can I simplify this at all? And they may have done some stuff that actually made it more complicated looking, so they went back to what they originally had. Or in the case of this one, as we'll see, there are times where something like this turns out to be a very simple answer, okay? So let's think about this one. Sine of x times cosine squared of x minus sine of x. What do you see that you could do? Kristen? Okay, we could factor out a sine. All right, and we get cosine squared x minus 1. Okay, what does that actually equal? Sine squared. Got to be careful with this one. No, no, negative. There we are. Okay, remember our identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So if you have cosine squared minus 1, you brought the 1 over here to the left, you've got to take the sine squared to the right, so it's a negative sine squared. Okay? So, but that's good here because now we have sine of x times a negative sine squared of x. What does that end up equaling? Negative sine to the... Very good. Negative sine to the third power. Okay. And that's a little simpler. Could you do it any other way? Um, what do you guys think? Is there a different way we could have simplified that? From the very first step, there's something we could have done a little bit different. You could factor out the negative sign. Factor out the negative <laughs> sign. Yeah, that would work. And that would give you sine squared x times negative sine x. Totally different. Okay. Something other than factoring. You can change sine to one cosine. over cosine. I mean, yeah. No, one well, that's one over cosecant. Cosecant. But that doesn't do anything. Yeah, that won't. That's going to get messy. What is cosine squared equal? What? One minus sine squared. Okay. So now I could distribute, right? And that's no. zero. No, so that's, there's my answer. No, that's to the third power. Okay. We multiply sine by one and get sine. We multiply sine by sine squared and get sine to the third. Right. Okay. I, I thought it's it's two. Oh. Let me make that clear. There we go. Okay. So either way, you get there. Yes. How do we know where it says fully simplified? 
Well, if you get to that point where you just have one thing, you're done. Okay. Um, now, there are some that you might have where you still got a couple of terms, but that's the best you can do. All right. That's why I like ones like prove this identity, where they tell you where you want to end up better, because then you know exactly when you're done. Because there are some people who might look at that and say, oh, okay, so now what? And they're sitting there five minutes trying to figure out what to do when they're actually done. Okay. All right, now, I, I want to kind of motivate this a little bit just by showing you an example. Um, well, two, two quick examples of how this can be used. Um, first of all, in solving equations, if I were given this equal to zero, as it is, I can't solve that equation. We'd have to do something to it in order to solve it, okay? If I get it down to this, Now I can actually solve it. I divide by negative 1, take the cube root of both sides, and I get sine of x equals 0. So where does sine equal 0? 1. Sine is 0. 0? And 360? And 180. And 180. Okay, or 0, pi, and 2 pi. All right, so this we can't solve, but once we simplify, we can solve it. And that's something that we're going to be doing a significant amount of later on in the in the unit. Okay? Another thing, just kind of looking ahead towards calculus, is uh, derivatives. Okay? And again, this is just one example. But, you know, we just showed that these two expressions are the same thing. And even though you don't know what a derivative is yet, probably, if I take the derivative of two things that are the same, I should get the same answer, the same answer right? Yes. Okay. Um, but let's look at the process for doing this. If I took the derivative of this, I'd bring the 3 out in front, I'd change the exponent down to a 2, and then I'd have to take the derivative of sine itself, and I'd get cosine. So that would look like this, All right? which I could just write down the answer to. It's one line. Okay? If I had this and tried to take the derivative of that. Wait, why can't we just write cosine again? That's calculus. Don't worry about it. It's just, if I have this, I can write down the answer. If I have this, I'd have to go through all that process. Okay? We'd have to use something called the product rule here because we're multiplying two things. And then we'd have to use the chain rule. And then we'd have to do some algebra. And then we'd have to use a trig identity. And finally, we would get to our answer. Okay, So we got the same place. But because we used the trig identities to simplify our expression before we tried taking a derivative, doing the more challenging part, which was taking the derivative, actually became quite easy. Okay, so I know that you don't understand derivatives yet, but you can understand one taking one line and one taking five lines to figure out, okay? So I'd much rather do one line. So now let's take a, a look at a couple others of these, all right? This shows up a lot. We have a situation like this where you have one over... And then you have a binomial in your denominator. Um, in this case, 1 plus sine of x. And before we do it the right way, let me ask you something. Is this okay? No. 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 All right. No, that's not okay. Right? If you're not sure, think about it in terms of numbers. If I had 1 over 2 plus 3, what does that equal? 1 half. 1 plus, fifth. Yeah. Okay? Does that equal 1 half plus 1 third? 
That's no. one six. Yeah, that would be five six. Oh, no, this five, was six. one fifth. Those are a whole lot different. Okay. No. Um, I don't know what happened right there. Okay, but here, so here, we cannot do this, all right? You cannot split a fraction into two separate fractions added together when it's the denominator that's being added together. You can only do it if you have two things in the numerator. For instance, if we had 1 plus x over 2, we could split that up so it was 1 half plus x over 2. And we would keep a common denominator. All right, so this is okay. What we saw at the beginning was not. So how do we, how do we fix that? How does that apply here? All right, well, we're not going to make it 1 plus cosecant. We're going to do this right here. Multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. And I will admit, this is kind of just a trick. You know, tricks are things that, at least in my mind, that aren't just, you look at it and, oh, yeah, let's do that. Um, it's something that just looking at the problem wouldn't naturally lead you to do. But this is something we're going to do. In this case, multiply by the conjugate of our denominator. Now, I'm not allowed to just multiply by something because I feel like it. What do I have to multiply by? One. One. Okay. I've got to multiply by one, a form of one. All right. The form of one I'm going to use is going to have that conjugate of the denominator in it. All right. So what would the conjugate of our denominator be? What is it? 1 minus sine of x. One minus sine of x. Now remember conjugates? When you multiplied conjugates like x plus 1 and x minus 1, what was unique about when you foil those? Uh, x squared minus uh, 1. Yeah, you got x squared minus 1. So how is that different than... Yeah, the, the middle part, the outers and inners in foil cancel out. Okay? And that's really why we're doing this, is because we don't want a middle function, a middle portion here, we want this to end up equaling 1 minus sine squared in the denominator. Okay? Why do I want it to equal 1 minus sine squared? So I can make it cosine squared. Right? 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared? Yeah. yeah. Now, you might, be, you might be saying, okay, well, how does that help us? So someone tell me, how does that help us? Oh. So our goal is to get rid of the fraction. You can, and that's in the right direction, but let's do it a little bit differently. Okay, we'll get to our secant squared x by doing what we were talking about at the beginning. We're going to split this into two separate fractions. 1 over cosine squared x minus sine over cosine squared x. Okay? There's that secant squared you were talking about. And then we need to uh, get rid of the fraction here as well. 
So what do you think? Okay, we want to use tangent, but we've got this cosine squared here. So if we made tangent, what would be left? A 1 over cosine, which is? Secant. Right? This right here, we could rewrite it as sine x over cosine x times 1 over cosine x. Okay? So there's my cosine squared. I just split, up, split those up. Really, if you remember the names of your properties, really what we're using here is the associative property for multiplication and regrouping things. So. All right, so does that make sense? I, I thought you weren't allowed to like, make it into two different things. You can't when there's addition like this. Like we had 1 over 1 plus sine. I can't split that up when there's addition. But with multiplication, with multiplication, notice it's still multiplication. And if I multiply those back together, I would get the cosine squared. Okay. All right. Yes, so this is the final answer. This is our final answer. Remember, our goal was to write it so that there are no fractions in it. And up until we got here, we still had fractions, but we were able to rewrite all those using reciprocal functions. Okay. okay. All right. Let's try one. I'm going to give you a couple minutes here. See what you can do with this one. Now, let me just introduce the, what we're trying to do here. It says verify the identity. Verify just means to prove that it's true. Okay? So we're proving that this identity is true. Now, let me give you a rule or two about when you do this. Okay? When you do this, you have to leave one side or the other alone. All right, you don't want to be messing with both sides, and you definitely don't want to be taking, you know, like subtracting the same thing from both sides of the equation or something like that. Okay? Now, it's possible, I guess, to take cosecant and work with it and make it look like a left hand side, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Okay? What I would do is take this left-hand side, and you want to simplify it, use identities, do whatever you can to try to get it to be cosecant theta. All right? So take a minute or two here. We'll see how far you can get, and then we'll uh, do all of it together.
You guys have two different ways of doing it. Let me show you one way, at least the start of one way. See how good my handwriting was, drawing, writing blind. blind. Well, that actually turned out halfway decent, although I forgot a parenthesis. Okay. So you see what I did? I'm only working with that first fraction. I haven't dealt with this at all. Where did I get that? That's the conjugate. Oh wait, um, I thought that if you multiply like it by that, you have to multiply it by everything. Well, if I were just multiplying it by one minus cosine, then yes, I would. But I'm actually just multiplying this fraction by one, so I'm not actually changing anything. I'm just changing what it looks like because I'm multiplying by one. Okay. Okay. Now, why would I do that? Just yes, Brett? Uh, so, yes, I squared. Where? Uh, I was going to see all of it. Okay, that 1 minus cosine squared is a Pythagorean identity. All right, it equals sine squared. So sine theta, oops, writing backwards here, 1 minus cosine theta over sine squared, I can now, because this is multiplication, I can reduce. Can you do 1 minus cosine theta over sine theta? Yes. Yes. This, one of those signs cancels out that sign. And then once I have it like that, I'm actually going to split it up. 1 over sine theta minus cosine theta over sine theta. And don't forget I had this plus cosine theta over sine theta here. Right. Oh, I'll cheat a little bit. There you go. Where did one go? Where did one go? The one is right here. Because now I have one minus cosine over just a sine. So I made it one over sine minus the cosine over the sine. And then you guys can see, hey, this is zero. And what is 1 over sine equal? Cosecant. Cosecant. Could you use MS by changing the second part to cosecant? Oh, sorry, that one. Yeah, you I can do that. I started that way, but I got lost. Can you can do that. that. And you'll find that you'll see an identity. And that, you know, the first time I had done it, I probably would have done that as well. You know, hey, cosine over sine, that's cotangent. Let's put it in there. And you may do that and then realize towards the end, Oh, I didn't have to after all. Or, if you already had cotangent here, you would have changed this to a minus cotangent. And then canceled them out. Okay? It's up to you. Eventually you would have had to multiply both conjugates. Well, actually, no. That's what I was going to say. Another strategy you could have used here would have been to get a common denominator. Oh. We want to add two fractions, right? Because And this is something to look out for. I have two things added together on the left-hand side, and I just have one thing on the right-hand side. So at some point, I'm going to have to put things together or have stuff cancel out like it did down there. Okay. Yes? So you could multiply like the second one by sine over sine, and you wouldn't have to multiply everything else. Yeah. Okay. 
And in fact, in this case, I'm going to multiply the first one I'm going to multiply the first one by sine over sine. Okay? Wait, why are you doing that? Because I want to get a common denominator with this fraction. But if you, if, you, if you multiply the first one by 1 minus cosine over 1 minus cosine, wouldn't it be sine squared theta? And then in the second one, you could multiply by sine over sine. Well, yeah, you could. You could at this point have gotten a common denominator here, but just more stuff would have canceled later on. Okay, and that's it again. That's the cool thing about these guys. You could, you know, we have 19 people in here. There could be 19 different ways you guys figure out how to do this. Okay, literally 19 or more. All right, here's one other common one that people might use. Um, to get a common denominator, I would have to multiply by cosine theta plus 1, and then I'd have sine times 1 plus cosine theta, okay? So I multiplied that by a form of 1. And then the whole reason for doing that is because if I distribute that cosine, I now have a sine squared plus cosine squared theta plus cosine, 